Welcome back to Trending in Education. Mike Palmer here, joined as always by Dan Strafford. Dan, how are you today? I'm doing well, Mike. Yourself? I'm, I'm doing nice. I'm doing nice. I'm doing mighty fine. And, uh, and we wanted to talk a little bit about the role parents can play in uh, education in general. And uh, Dan, uh, you know, I decided to flip the script a little bit, I brought us in and uh, you're now more of an expert because you have, uh, how many school age children do you have? Two, uh, a nine and a six year old, so fourth and first grade. Nice, so uh, Dan will be wearing that hat a little bit as we talk about uh, parental engagement and uh, parent, uh, parents as advocates. And uh, we're fortunate enough to be joined by a friend uh, of the show, Dennis Morgan. So uh, Dennis Morgan, who I've known for, for many, many years uh, in a bunch of different capacities, but Dennis here today is really representing as someone who uh, had kids, uh, got very involved uh, and engaged about his kids' uh, educational experiences, and then that's now evolved a little more into uh, advocacy and getting involved uh, at the, the local uh, district level. Uh, Dennis, uh, Dennis hey, Morgan, welcome to the show. Thank you, Mike. Thank you both for having me. Hello, Dan. First time I'm meeting you. Nice to meet you. Same here. Uh, yeah. Thanks for bringing me in, Mike. That's yeah. nice. Yeah, no, it's good to have you. And uh, is this your first time on a podcast? This is my first time on a podcast. Nice. You're doing fantastic so far. You know, this is probably the easiest part for me. Yeah. I well, love I, to talk. The good thing about the podcast, it doesn't get that much harder than this. <laughs> so uh, so we'll, we'll see how it goes. So. Um, Maybe you could, could begin just by giving uh, our listeners a little bit of context around, uh, you know, your experiences specifically sure. around getting involved in, um, you know, your your children's sure. uh, school lives, and then also becoming more of a mentor and advocate, uh, you know, uh, within New within the schools in New York. Yeah. So similar to Dan, I've got two. Uh, we are in the public school system. Mm -hmm. um, my daughter is eight. Son is 11, mm -hmm. so he's going into middle school. Got it. Um, we've been in Harlem now for, I mean, all of my son's school age, so it, that was back in pre-K, so he's been doing eight years, I guess, seven or eight years yep. in a Harlem school. Um, it really wasn't until boy, maybe when he came into kindergarten that I started getting involved in the PTA. Yep. Um, my parents were never involved in, the, at least I don't believe so, sure. like when I was growing up. I don't even know how much the PTA really mattered, right? So this is all in California. That's where I'm originally from. Right. And uh, I don't remember, I remember their level of engagement was generally parent-teacher conferences. Yep. Report cards. Yep. And dropping me off and picking me up. Sure. Um, really simple levels of engagement. Mm -hmm. um, I have had the privilege of being part of a school community that um, has allowed me to actively participate. Um, it started it, when my son was in pre-K, I think I probably attended my first PTA meeting and I sort of looked around at the parent body and um, our school, just to give a, a little bit more context, is extremely diverse, right? It's got a lot of, uh, uh, if we break it down ethnically, it's got a lot of African-Americans and Latinos, a lot of black and brown kids, a lot of black and brown families. Mm -hmm. Um, not as many at that time Caucasian. There was a rumor at the school that like, don't stay in the school past kindergarten. Mm -hmm. It all goes to crap or whatever, mm -hmm. um, which ended up not being the truth. Um, but what we were seeing is that we'd get a lot of people involved. We have a really strong pre-K program mm -hmm. and we'd get a lot of parents involved at our school and um, they would, um, they'd stay for that, for that pre-K experience. It was really strong. And the goal at the time was like to try to bridge that, that gap to keep them, to get them to stay on. And there were families that were not black or brown that did stay on. And, and just to be clear, this is before universal pre-K. No, this was universal pre-K. So this, this was coinciding with mm -hmm. uh, New York City having universal pre-K? Yeah, yeah. Got it. So like that was part of where yeah. the activation happened yes. by virtue of universal pre-K. Uh, Mayor de Blasio famously is, uh, is he, he's kind of campaigning for president in part based yeah. on yeah. universal pre-K. We'll avoid yeah. going like into depth. platform to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but this was partly parents who came in through a, 
a free pre-K program yeah. perhaps. Who, yeah. So that level of engagement was there and you were trying to bridge that into... Into moving into kindergarten and so yeah. forth. But the thing that was really um, becoming more and more clear to me was that uh, parent engagement at that time looked very different. It was a small group of parents who would show up regularly, maybe 20. We, we had our PTA meetings on the weekend. I think we still do. Some of the times we have them during the week. But mm -hmm. um, it was maybe 20 or less, maybe 10. As the year went on, those numbers would sort of diminish. Yep. Right? So the end of the year, you kind of have like seven. Yep. Um, but the engagement was very similar. We all were saying the same thing. right? We all wanted better opportunities for our kids. We were all very focused on money. So in District 3, which is probably one of the most segregated districts in New York City, mm -hmm. uh, and New York City being one of the most segregated school districts in the country, mm -hmm. um, we see a lot of um, economic disparity within our schools, specific, specifically in District 3. Yep. Um, the southern end of our district, which is uh, the District 3 runs from about 59th Street, uh, which is... Um, Midtown Manhattan mm -hmm. uh, to Central Park West and then runs to the water for the most part. Mm -hmm. And it runs all the way up to Harlem. So um, about 123rd Street. Mm -hmm. um, and just to be clear, Harlem keeps going. <laughs> right. <laughs> so Harlem is the southern end of Harlem. The southern end of, yeah. southern end of Harlem. So, and but, it's a great but you, but, you, but you also have uh, Upper West Side in that area. Yes. You have like, yes. you have a, like some pretty affluent, when you're talking Extremely about. Affluent. Yeah, yeah, that's the disparities yes. you're, you're, you're yeah. kind of talking about. You said I had an excellent point, though. <laughs> you do. You make an excellent, excellent point, Mike, because I focus very heavily on Harlem, but I, my, right now my, my constituency lives within the southern end of Harlem. Yep. Uh, the northern end of Harlem is, has equal challenges, if not greater, mm -hmm. right? And the thing that I'm, I'm noticing, I'm starting to meet more of those parents. Like, we are all extremely aware Yep. of the situation that our schools are in um, and the situation that I put, that puts our children in. Yep. And, um, you know, if I sort of bounce back to advocacy, it's, it's really about holding the, uh, the Department of Education, the DOE, accountable mm -hmm. for providing a reasonable expectation, uh, education. Yep. Right? So yep. making sure that our kids are being educated properly, getting enough enrichment, um, within all of the programs that are available. Yep. And then um, finding a way to get them motivated to move into high school, providing yep. them an education that allows them to graduate high school yep, yep. and compete for college and mm -hmm. then ultimately compete for those high paying jobs. Yeah. Well, and also, uh, you know, it sounds like a part of the advocacy is also around outreach, right? So like, you know, trying to pay it forward, I guess, in that However, you were activated to be engaged in your children's educational lives. You're trying to get other parents similarly activated yeah. in their own kids' lives so that you're like, that's how it actually yeah. becomes more of a movement as opposed to, you know, you making whatever activity you right. can make happen. Right. Like you're trying to activate more parents in the community. Yeah. So um, it's a, it's a really interesting point. So I was, um, so in my role, I'm on the Community, community Education Council for District 3. Yep. Uh, that is what has come into play and replaced the school boards. Yes. Um, in my role, I'm actually appointed by the Manhattan Borough President. Yep. Um, so Gail Brewer has appointed me on my, for my second term. Uh-huh. And um, one of the conversations, it's, being on the council is really challenging some of the times because you sort of start to see the inner workings of the DOE in New York City, and, and you really... I think there was a moment, right, where I was just like throwing my hands up. I couldn't believe that uh, what a principal had been going through to try to staff her school effectively mm -hmm. um, when she was in a, uh, the situation was that they had, I think it was 34 kids or 36 kids in a class, which is yep. by, the, um, by the DOE's blue book, you're only supposed to have at most 32. And at that point, the union, the teachers can file a grievance yeah. with their union. Right. Um, but it was a total debacle. Mm -hmm. And I just remember hearing the principal and seeing her be emotional about this thing that was, she was led to believe she was using the right resources, but there wasn't, there just really was a very poor communication on who she could use to sort of fill those seats and split that class up. Yep. Um, is at that point, I was really ready to sort of throw my hands up mm -hmm. um, because it was not just that one occurrence. There had been several occurrences where we had just struggled as a council to understand like who's running the ship 
how are principals supported? Mm -hmm. Who's accountable? Yeah. And um, I spoke to Gail and one of her representatives and her policy um, representative at the time, education policy representative, and what she had learned long getting to the to the turn here. Um, what she had informed me, I should say, was that the goal isn't for me to sort of sit in this seat and start to dictate education policy. To right. your point, Mike, it's really about how do I create more people like me? Mm -hmm. How do I meet people and start to sort of get them to understand how important it is to be involved and how they can be involved and not really trying to replicate my level of involvement, yeah. but trying to find within them what they feel strong about. Yeah. How do we get that switch to turn on in them? Mm -hmm. um, you know, usually when I'm, when I'm speaking to other parents about being involved in our school, um, the thing that I really reach toward and sort of lean on is that the way it's been set up now at the DOE is that it's really important for parents to be there. They've sort of outsourced a lot of their responsibility, if you will, to the parents. Mm -hmm. And in that paradigm, it's, it's up to us to be deeply involved. And what I'm usually pitching is like, this is an opportunity for you to build a school in your image. Mm -hmm. It's always in partnership with the administration and the staff, but we're really just focusing on like, what do we need to do to build this school from the ground up? Mm -hmm. Roll your sleeves up. What can you do to contribute? Right. What are the, what are the talents and, and resources that you're able to bring into the conversation to help to build and make this school? The pitch has been really, um, I feel like it's been successful. Mm -hmm. It's resonated very deeply with a lot of parents. Uh, in the neighborhood. So like I was saying, when I came into the school, there was a very large percentage of um, black and brown and a smaller percentage of white parents that were there. Mm -hmm. um, we've started to see that shift and change, um, which is really good. Yeah. Um, you know, right now the studies all show that the more diverse, whether that be ethnically or culturally or socioeconomically, your children's classrooms can be, mm -hmm. the more, the, the higher academic performance there you can expect yep. to see. Yep. Um, so we've made a very concerted effort to sort of reach out and let everybody know that this is an opportunity to really participate in building a vision together. Yeah. yeah. Um, I did want to, um, maybe just a couple, I wanted to bring Dan in a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, but, um, you know, the one, one area I wanted to explore was just finding the time for advocacy <laughs> and like having time, like, cause that does particularly for, um, parents who are facing more challenges at home, yep. single parents, yep. all yep. those kinds of things, yep. like it's even harder to get activated. So I'd love to, love to maybe dig in on that uh, next. But, uh, but I wanted to bring you in, Dan, a little bit as a parent of two school age kids, one more uh, on her way to being uh, at least pre-K and then into school yep. age. Um, what's, your, what's your story been like in terms of your, your level of activation and, um, you know, just sort of responding a little bit to what, what Dennis has been talking about. Yeah, I think as uh, differently growing up, my mother was very involved. Uh, my mother was PTA president and advocated very strongly for myself and my two brothers to the point of almost us having to ask her to back off at times. <laughs> but um, she was great and, and taught me, you know, if you want something, you have to go for it and you have to advocate for yourself and, and be in, in the classroom or in the office of the counselor or the principal or whoever it may be. Uh, with my children, we started in New York. We were living in Astoria. My eldest got to do universal pre-K, which mm -hmm. was an amazing experience. Uh, this is personal experience for me, but it got her set for kindergarten like nothing we've seen up here in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. um, my experience has been that our PTO is a strong organization. Um, it is one that is heavily involved in almost all aspects of what the school has to offer. I think similarly, uh, money is the root of it all, like trying to the fundraising and figure out where money's coming from to pay for those uh, extra activities, those uh, counselors coming in, the uh, assemblies and all those different things where they all come in. Personally, I'm not as involved as I should be. And that's something I've actually talked to my wife about recently. I've let and allowed myself to watch her be involved mm -hmm. and allowed her to be the one who goes to PTO meetings and, and does the volunteering. And uh, I think that's a dynamic as well uh, between a couple, between two partners who leans in, who stays home during those meetings, who leans right. in and, yeah. and offers their services. So I've tried to volunteer from time to time uh, because of certain things they may have needed, a uh, photographer or, or uh, I, I DJed once, which was uh, nice. an interesting experience. Um, but it, it is uh, a pretty strong organization here in my hometown and in, in the city I live in uh, for the school I'm involved in district wide and, and city wide. Uh, the 
education PTO and that is less uh, organized. So there's not really a citywide parent organization right. uh, that gets together across the entire city. It's more, right. more school-based. Mm-hmm. Right. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, in a, actually maybe uh, Dennis, just to pick up on the, how do you find time uh, to, to do this as a parent? How are you engaged in, within your, um, your schools and communities? And then a uh, related point that Dan was kind of touching on too is like, uh, you know, as a father, um, is that, is, is it typical for the fathers to get involved or are there, di- are there interesting challenges or complexities around that where like, uh, um, I thought that was interesting when Dan was raising that too, like where as parents, yeah, uh, you sort you of know, have to have the balance, right? Yeah. And you want to figure out, you know, is that if my, if my wife's going to be going to the, the meetings, yeah. Uh, somebody yeah. has to, like, if you have another kid at home, somebody has got to take care of the kids. Like it does relate very much to, um, to just what families have the capacity for when yeah. individuals have the capacity for. Yeah. Um, so I thought, you know, Dan's, Dan's response made me start thinking a little bit about that, sure. but, but more broadly, just, um, how, how, do I get the time? how were you able to get the time and then how much is time management? And, you know, when you're trying to activate parents, uh, it's it's not easy to be a parent uh period and then uh, you add to that the complexity of being a parent in new york yeah um can you talk a little bit about sure. what that's been like sure so um the time commitment it scales right like if i can commit eight hours a day every day mm-hmm. the whatever it is i'm committing to would absolutely absorb it and 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 be able to grow and foster from that yeah. level of commitment yep um I sort of swing between, so we always have, um, we have a meeting once, uh, at least with, uh, within the, within the CEC, the communication, uh, community education council, uh, within that context, there's a certain amount of time commitment that's sort of required. Mm-hmm. And I use my air quotes around required. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We, our, our listeners can pick up on <laughs> your, 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 your nonverbal. I just wanted to make yeah. sure they yeah. knew that there were quotes around yeah. required. Yeah. Um, we uh, basically do a, one meeting a month. The mm-hmm. meeting generally runs like four hours um, yeah. <laughs> or can run four hours. Yeah. Um, and then we're, you know, the time that we commit to the schools right now, we have a structure. We have, we have two sort of standing structures, uh, which are committees mm-hmm. and um, uh, liaisons for, for, our, for particular schools. Sure. And within those two, there's probably one meeting a month, which probably the committee meeting a month, which runs about maybe an hour to two hours. Yeah. And if you can make time, um, whether that be sending out an email, making a phone call or making a visit to the, your liaison school, yeah. um, that usually runs about an hour. So at bare minimum, it's mm-hmm. probably three or four hours. But the, the reality is like emails are flying back and forth. Sure. Like within district three, there's always something going on. Yeah. Um, the press is always very hot to pick up on something. And a lot of parents, because of their access, yeah. um, have a lot of access to news media. Yeah, I know. I, even though this may be your first podcast, I have seen you on uh, oh, local yeah. local yeah. news. So like, you know, you, you know, you, you're expanding your range. I appreciate <laughs> that. But, but yeah, I was, I was trying to understand, uh, in addition to the specifics, more like just like making the mind space yeah. to kind of carve out of a busy life time to you know first be engaged and then to become more of like a influencer advocate you know it almost seems like you gotta were you were you hitting the ground running right away or were you exploratory no, early no that's a that's a great question mike so um that's a great question mike thank you um it started so, so yes it started at those pta meetings and then um i had noticed there was something that i noticed that just didn't feel right i can't it, it was probably some some behavioral problems or something that I had started to correlate between like, well, why do these schools at the Southern end have so many parents involved? How is it that they're becoming successful? And one of the things that was an easy one, like sort of the slam dunk for me to sort of attach onto was really about the money. Mm. And I was engaged by a friend of mine and she, she was like, Oh, it sounds like you, you know, this, there's a, there's an opportunity here for you to get involved. And, um, it was at that point that I was sort of exploring what it meant to be on the council, how I would be involved. At the time, it didn't look like a bunch of projects. It mm-hmm. didn't look like, you know, 10 hours of work a week or 15. Like it wasn't so much how much time do I have to commit as much as it was like, what really needs to get solved? Yep. Um, I don't necessarily, appro- I know it's going to take time. Like right. my, I guess 
the headspace is not temporal, mm-hmm. right? The headspace is around cause and effect. Yeah. Um, we and, put on. Well, and, and just kind of expanding on that though too, like have you encountered other parents who have, who are harder to engage with because they don't have the ability to, to, to really give more the mind space to begin with. Cause I, I, I have to, I have to assume that's got to be part of the advocacy and like evangelism of the job is to yeah. try to like get parents more comfortable connecting. Yeah. It's interesting, Mike, cause I'm really trying to solve that problem right now within our council. It's yeah. not, not the problem, but the challenge in front of us, right? Like how do we get more people to be present? Yes. But this, I guess where it sort of strays from, from your specific question is like understanding these levels of engagement, Mm -hmm. right? So being able to, um, so in Dan's case, like his mother was fully involved, right? Right. That's a, there's many levels of engagement and that's one of them. And I'm very much like, I'm not only at the PTA meeting and not only did I serve as PTA president or PTA vice president for four years, like Uh I'm involved in the council and there's like, that's like sort of another level. Yeah. But to some extent, like if I really peel it back, I'm looking at some parents who you, who I think you might be describing as like maybe two jobs. Yeah. You know, maybe all sorts of changes and challenges. Just single, and single parent. And, yeah, I mean, right. like you're, you're, single you're, parent, you're right. together with your wife. Like right. not, not every parent has that. Absolutely. And then like, absolutely. Can that parent, how can that parent engage and how so, do you reach that parent? I guess is what I'm asking about. Yeah. I, I guess what I'm, what I'm sort of arguing is that just them getting their child prepared mm-hmm. and ready for school mm-hmm. is engaged. Mm-hmm. Sure. Um, the question that I would sort of throw back to you is like, are you talking about receiving communication? Mm -hmm. Are you talking about specific instances or moments where they need to be present? Yeah. Um, Yeah. I mean, what I'm trying to get at, I guess, is like, where do parents have the most influence over their child's education? Mm -hmm. And then how did they get, how do they get the right information so that they can make good choices when when they can, Uh, whether that is, you know, ways in which they can get involved, ways, ways in which they can, provide children with resources, ways in which they can become an advocate in the way that you have. But like, it does seem like however you've navigated it, like you have gotten to a point where you're being smart about how you're allocating your energy because you're trying to make an impact. And uh, I was just wondering how you would try to reach uh, either folks who are listening or people who are listening who might be able to activate other people I got gotcha. you uh, like how, how did how did you solve that problem and ha- and do you have any advice for others uh, in terms of staying engaged and finding the time so I don't I really don't know if this example I'm going to give you is going to answer your question yeah but if I look at you as the model yeah right if I look at you as a prospective parent yeah right? yeah I don't know if it's been known information that you now have a child yes I, yes okay, so yes sure. i do i do yes matthew <laughs> we've talked about sure. matthew on okay, the show good, yes good, good, good. Our, so, my secret is out matthew's not ready right yeah. he's not ready to go to school today yeah he's you might think almost so. eight months you yeah. might think so yeah yeah but uh it could easily start now right sure. so i've had parents show up to one of our pta tours so usually there's a tour that's mm-hmm. given right that's probably one of your first, there's probably two things that happen initially, right? You yeah. start to realize like, oh, at some point I've got to find care yeah. while I'm at work. Right. Does that care involve some academic, you know, yeah. construct or curriculum, yeah, 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 right? Yeah. Or yeah. is it just playtime? Right. Um, so let's say for instance, you're on a tour. I've seen this before. Parents show up, baby is literally like a year and a half, yeah. right? They've got literally three years before they even need to be thinking about anything. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. they're taking a tour through the school. Sure. So there's that moment. This right. is like a K twelve, right? This is like a K twelve. They have they or have a K to or K to whatever, K-A, but kindergarten right? or pre K even, right? So yeah. she's even there three years early for uh-huh. pre K. Wow. Okay. And it's a in New York City. That's the thing. Do you yeah. have any uh, expectant mothers come for tours? I I mean not usually. Okay, good. But there is that extreme case, right? Yeah, I'm yeah. not going to put that off the table. So sure. There's that moment where advocacy and and potential engagement are available. Mm-hmm. My, my common response to them is like, well, this is really early. Yeah, like, don't right. let the, because what happens here, at least, I don't know if it's the same um, in Massachusetts, but the, um, you know, the parents go crazy over this yes, stuff. And yes. It's like, I got to be, I got to get very, the best school. It's I gotta very get competitive. It. It's super competitive. Yeah. And um, generally, you know, you can sort of show up within that year before you're ready to go, you do your school tour. So anyway, yeah. going back to it. That second moment is usually when they're really sort of realize like, okay, this is where I want to go. This is what I want to do yeah. uh, for my child. Um, 
second level of engagement, if we think of this like the, um, the McKinsey funnel, are you familiar with that? I'll roll with you. <laughs> so the McKinsey funnel is how um, people choose to become brand advocates, uh -huh. right? Their shopping experience. Sure. Right. So on the outside of that funnel sort of swirling around is you gathering information. Right. Right. It's at each one of those moments that the switch could be turned on. Sure. And you can become really engaged. Yep. We do our best to try to keep people informed about our school. Yep. So that level of engagement, if you are coming to us and yeah. you're like, I'm interested and you're three years early. Right. We'd probably be like, we can put you on a mailing list. Yeah. Let you see what's going on in our schools. So Got that it. You're getting information about what's possible. Got it. Yep. Um, that next level is really when you're like up against it and you're like, okay, now I'm ready to start preschool. Right. At that point, it's going to be easier for us to pull you in. Mm -hmm. um, that level of engagement usually looks like a parent who's super excited, nervous. Yeah. They need, they need the partnership and the bond of other parents to help them sort of understand what's going on out yes. there. Yes. Um, the thing that I like to do at that point is really starting to make it clear that there's a, if you're thinking public schools, this mm -hmm. is outside of charters. That's a, sure. it's a different world. Yeah. I, I wanted to school. touch briefly on that before we wrap, yeah. but yeah, 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 yeah. So coming into those public schools, you need to have some understanding of like how the DOE functions, mm -hmm. what it looks like coming in, how there's a level of, um, or how there's very little transparency mm -hmm. into like what's going to happen next. So you submit your application, you wait for several months and yeah. then something spit back out to you. Right. 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 Um, at that moment, it's really important, or what I try to do is bring them a bit closer, let them know like you're not experiencing anything uncommon. Right, right. right. What you're going through right now is what we've been trying to do, and this is where the sales pitch starts to get a bit sharper, right? Yeah, yeah. What we've been trying to do is get a higher level of transparency into the DOE, especially when it comes to um, uh, moments and opportunity in pre-K. Pre uh-huh. Um, because you're going to have to do this one more time. Sure. Right. Yep. Pre-K is completely separate from kindergarten. Again, the pitch gets a little more robust and fuller because now they're a bit more informed. Right. They've talked to more people and they're starting to move their way down that funnel to start advocating for a specific school if I they see. haven't gotten there already. Yeah. And I was struck, uh, you know, the, I do understand the McKinsey funnel. I just I hadn't made that connection that to think about advocating for your school or your district in some ways it is a marketing exercise right. because right. you're competing. That's right around the choices that parents can make. And if parents opt out of your school, your school will lose the funding of the, that, that that child would provide. Yeah. yeah. So one of the arguments that's going on, cause I don't want to sort of leave that off the table. The um, uh, campaign for fiscal equity, the mm -hmm. CFE is a campaign that's going on now where we're trying to get all of our schools equitably funded. Yep. And by equitably, it doesn't mean everybody gets a thousand dollars. It means that if your school is in high need, you get, Five hundred and fifty dollars, right? Thousand dollars, right? It's more than thousands of dollars. We're talking, I believe, it's in the billions. Right? Mm -hmm. How much our schools in New York City are owed? Um, so that component, the argument right now is like, well, it wouldn't be on the backs of our parents to cover that gap. I think some of what you talk about is like this financial gap that if your students, if you're not getting enough students, it puts more onus on the parents to be able to drive money to create the resources yeah. and the academic programming that right. you need. Right. Um, there's an argument out there that says, well, if we had enough money for our students and if there, there's a complex out, not algorithm, but it, it's almost like that. There's yeah. A, there's a, um, there's a rubric or a metric mm -hmm. um, that allows us to understand um, how much each student is basically valued at yeah. by the DOE. And it's yeah. a, it's a, it's a formula that's used to say, well, are you high needs? Are you coming from English as your second language? I see. You? And they use that to sort of determine like, all right, base level, everybody's at an index of one, mm -hmm. you get 1000 per student. Yep. If you have these other needs or you're coming from these other areas, you, you get a little, you more. get a little more. That's sure. right. Yeah. So ideally that's supposed to set up these schools to be more successful and compete, right? Mm -hmm. So that we're bringing the right amount of resources. Yeah. But the trap that they're in right now is that Number one, they've defunded all of the schools. They haven't brought the money in that they that the state has not brought the money in that they've said they're going to bring in. Yeah. So that's one piece. Secondarily, when you're looking at the charter school structure, they're able to funnel through. Um, I know that they're supposed to be dot orgs, right? So yeah. they're supposed to be these um, these not these these not, not for profit, for profit. industries. Yeah. yeah. The truth is, the people that are in there are for profit. Right? Sure. They're in there bringing the money into these schools. Um, there's what happens now is that there's because of the space so if your school starts to dwindle that space and yeah. you start losing those bodies yeah um a charter school basically every year they publish like the numbers mm -hmm. and a charter school can easily say well there's actually 
two or 300 seats in there, I'm ready to start up right now. Yeah. I'm ready to extend my current footprint right. and take over those two to 300 seats. Yeah, yeah. To your marketing point, they've got the deeper pockets too. Yeah. And you probably, maybe you haven't seen, but we've got tons of billboards in, um, in Harlem mm-hmm. that talk about this prep or this academy or yeah. this, this thing. Yeah. Um, I've seen them on buses. They've got their banners, they've yeah. got all of this stuff. So one of the things I've been pushing really hard for is just trying to level that playing field. Yep. One of the things that we struggle with in the DOE and, and public schools is that we don't necessarily have that level of resourcing. So what I do personally is try to provide that level through my, um, I have a for-profit business uh-huh. that looks at bringing, um, bringing technology resources, brand and, 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 um, brand and design resources into schools with high need areas I see. In, in high needs areas. Yeah. Yeah. So that's through the Harlem collab. And that's like, that's really where I'm trying to partner with schools to sort of help bolster them and help get them to that. I know it's, um, it's, it's a tough line to walk. So the thing that's going through my head right now is like, well, how can you be for profit if you're trying to help all these nonprofits? But right. The reality is like, we've got to find some way to bring funding into it. And I, I've got to find, um, a meaningful way to make sure everybody knows that whatever's at the end of this, if they're paying for something, that they're going to get something of, of real value. And I yeah. try to work with grants and try to, you know, financially, I'm trying, I know the population that I'm working with and I sure. know that within public schools, there's not a lot of funding. Yeah. Um, and then the advocacy is really about your, your local public school yeah. for, to a large extent. Right. Yeah. So the idea is like, cause one of the major problems is, even that there's the charter school problem on the one hand, which which causes some of that dwindling of enrollments, but right. then there's also which public school you want to get your kids yeah. to because attend. Choice, choice becomes an issue. Yeah, right? so like there's two levels in which uh, you know you you can cause these um, almost like the a attrition, f- right? yeah, like a funding desert. Yeah. You know, like so basically everyone's exiting their local uh, public schools, yeah. and uh, you're saying that one way in which that could be addressed is by activating parents to begin to, you know, invest more of their time. Yeah. And then it's not just their time though. It's also how do how do they get the appropriate funding? How do they compete right. on a level playing field with the other options that are out there? Yeah. Um, it's all really, uh, you know, interesting stuff. I think we're just scratching uh, the surface of it. Um, Dan, I wanted to bring you in maybe one more time. Do you have any uh, thoughts or any questions uh, for, for Dennis? I think the question that came to mind as you were discussing through everything is, Dennis, you're at a very, you know, local level doing this, right? District three in New York City, one of the biggest cities in the world. How do you scale this message or or share this message to other parents, not in New York City, people who might be dealing with different dynamics, different circumstances, but that equally want to be as involved and push for public schools, advocate for their students? How do you how do you translate that from New York City elsewhere? Our, our problems are so specific to where we are. So the charter school problem is sort of wide ranging, right? That one I think is easy enough. If you are not a charter school parent and you're focused on bringing you know, the, right, the right type of education into your school and it's a public school, um, if you're starting to realize that your public schools are closing all around you, like what we're really trying to do is provide opportunities for all children. So the one thing that charter schools don't have to do is educate all children. Mm-hmm. They basically can coach out the kids that have um, IEPs or some sort of, you know, are struggling uh, psychologically. Um, anything, any one infraction can allow them to sort of exit your child. Mm-hmm. The only safety net is a public school at that point, mm-hmm. right? The only the only entity that we currently have is a public school, and that public school has to teach all children. And 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 thankfully, and and happily, right? Like it's not like oh god, we're burdened with it. No, yeah. Like we want to make sure all students are getting the education and the resources they need. Um, and I think it comes back to that when I talk about resourcing, it's not, I'm trying to take it off the backs of parents in a lot of ways, but the problem is the way they've structured it, especially here in New York, is that the additional funding isn't coming from the schools. They're not, they're not resourcing them properly, mm-hmm. right? So it outsources that funding capacity on the parents. Mm-hmm. That's, who else is gonna do it? Yeah. Right? You know, I don't see a lot of organizations coming in voluntarily. Right, right. right? It requires that parent outreach, right? Mm-hmm. I go out and I speak to the local businesses, right, right. or I go out through my connections, here at Kaplan or wherever it is and try to bring in people that, that can like 
help to make a better environment. Sure. Right. right um, there's right, a right. number of organizations out there, but they're not always like, I'm coming into your school. I'm going to do this thing. Let's talk about what this looks like for you. Yeah. Um, it's generally requiring somebody who has access and reach mm -hmm. to sort of bring them, bring them in, bring them closer, identify where the, um, where the opportunities are and the collaboration could take place. And then, Putting that together, and that's really where I'm, where I'm really heavily focusing. If it's not coming from design and branding for me, I'm trying to bring in other opportunities for these schools to get stronger. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah, no, it's great, and um, yeah, a lot, a uh, lot to take away. Obviously, uh, a lot of complexity, a lot of problems to solve, uh, which is why I think, regardless of your position on a lot of these uh, different uh, aspects, whether it's charter schools, school choice, uh, you know, the importance of public schools. Um, I think the what my one of my biggest takeaways is that you know without engaged parents who are leaning into uh, their their children's educational futures, uh, you know none of these problems are going to get solved, and that uh, you know there needs to be more advocacy around um, that safety net you're talking about, where like you know the fact that public schools are you know a public good and right, they are providing right. services for for kids who are not uh, necessarily getting the level of uh, care and attention that that other uh, components of uh, of our educational uh, system are getting um, that's definitely something for us to continue to think about continue to uh, to, to kind of uh, track on the show <laughs> A conversation that will continue here on Trending in Education across our social media platforms. And of course, we wanted to continue with you if you have an opinion about parent advocacy, about getting involved, PTAs, PTOs, and all the different organizations you can join as a parent or what your experience has been. We'd love to hear from you at Trending in Ed on Facebook or Twitter or trendingineducation.com. You can find our website there. We'd be happy to hear from each and every one of you on this topic and what your experience has been, whether as a student or as a parent of students at present. As always, special thanks to Mike for all the great content each and every episode. Dennis, wonderful guest. We'll hopefully hear from him again in the future. With that said, thanks as always for listening to Trending in Education.